Hello, everybody. Welcome to week 33 of ENM 2020. We are in the, the kind of final phase of formal classes, which is to say we're talking about frontiers in ecological niche modeling. Um, you've had a bunch of neat talks, and there's still several neat talks ahead of us. Um, but in between the neat talks, I'm going to give you maybe a little bit of a break from correlative ecological niche modeling, and instead of focus on um, asking and addressing in novel ways some kind of big questions in ecology and biogeography. So I'm going to jump into a, a presentation about some work with virtual species and virtual worlds, and my focus is mainly on on the virtual worlds aspect of it. Um, so, so let's, let's take a look and see what you think. Okay, this work um, that I'm gonna be telling you about today comes from a, a collaboration that I've genuinely enjoyed. Um, years ago, we had a couple of, of graduate students uh, about to finish up their PhDs and, and leave uh, University of Kansas, and a postdoc who was also wrapping up his time. Um, and these three young biologists came to Jorge, Jorge Soberon and me and asked if we would be interested in starting a collaboration. And when they described it to us, I, I thought, this, is gonna, this isn't going to go very far. But it was interesting and they'd thought it out and they clearly talked about it. So the two uh, graduating uh, students were, were Corey Myers and Aaron Saup uh, and the postdoc was Hui Jie Chiao. Um, and so this is work kind of by the five of us, by the three of them plus Jorge and me. Uh, the programming has been done uh, exclusively by Hui Jie Chiao. Um, and the rest of us have participated in thinking and, and asking questions and designing and analyzing. Um, so this has been a, a, a fascinating collaboration and I'm, I'm very happy to share it with you, to be honest. Now, there's been quite a bit of work with virtual species in ecological niche modeling which is to say, if you're trying to develop a methodology for niche modeling, um, there's one problem, which is that you never know the truth. You always have, you know, what is the true geographic distribution of this species? Well, I don't know. And what is the true, um, what are the true dimensions of the ecological niche of this species? Also, I don't know. And so, way back, um, quite a ways back, maybe 20 years ago, people started using um, ecological niches that were, that were manufactured. They were, they were called virtual species, uh, but this is just the idea that you can take a, um, a simple model, a simple um, example niche that has certain characteristics and you can use it to design and address questions about ecological niches and ecological niche modeling and the methods that we use. Um, there are certainly limitations, which is to say you can only address a situation of complexity up to the level of complexity that you built into your, your virtual species. And some of the uh, especially the early virtual species were very simple. Maybe they were just two-dimensional boxes in environmental space. Now there are many tools out there for uh, creating virtual species and exploring them. Um, so, so there's a fair amount of sophistication. And these, these methods have yielded some of the really crucial uh, fundamental methodological papers that we that we use as the basis for for 
uh, this methodology of ecological niche modeling. To be honest with you, I'm not going to spend much time on virtual species. Um, maybe we have not emphasized them enough in this course. But what I really want to point you towards is the idea of going beyond um, the questions of, of just, you know, let's model the ecological niche of the species and predict its distribution or look at its distribution as it changes through time. Rather, I think there's quite a bit of space for, um, for using these techniques using these conceptual frameworks to address some big questions. And so I want to give you kind of one example of that um, that's come out of the collaboration I just described to you um, and, and maybe set you to thinking about, about analyses and questions that you could design. So let's talk about this, this um, latitudinal diversity gradient. It's been known for hundreds of years. Um, here, here's a quote from Alexander von Humboldt. The nearer we approach the tropics, the greater the increase in the variety of structure, grace of form, and mixture of colors, as also in perpetual youth and vigor of organic life. So Humboldt did this amazing uh, journey across the Americas and and really had a unique early opportunity to appreciate how much more diverse the tropics were than temperate areas to the south or to the north. <coughs> now, we have obviously much more sophisticated views of the latitudinal diversity gradient now. Uh, here's a view of uh, vertebrate diversity from Manyat et al. Uh, 2014. And there are a couple interesting things here. I mean, you see this, this band across kind of the, the belt of the earth, which is highly diverse and is, is in red, and then lower diversity in blue, both north and south of that, of that belt. But you can also see some interesting um, variations on it. Notice for example, Africa does not have as much diversity and Asia does not have as much diversity as South America does. Notice that Africa has a really diverse um, region going down into South Africa and curling down to the very southern tip of, of Africa, which particularly for plants is very, very high in diversity. Notice the same, uh, something similar in Australia lower overall diversity in the equatorial regions of, of Asia and Australia, maybe because these were islands, maybe there are area effects. Suffice it to say, there's some really interesting questions here, there's some really interesting contrasting patterns. And so this certainly merits some close, um, some close looks and a lot of discussion and analysis. We've certainly seen that. Here we go in, in marine systems. This is diversity of copepods. And again, you see that belt across uh, the middle part of the earth. And here for vascular plants. And you, know, you can see these you know, true global hotspots you can see the major patterns, which are similar to what I showed you for vertebrates, but also with some interesting exceptions. I've already pointed you towards Southern Africa, but look also Southern Europe, look at Mexico. And we see even more of kind of a latitudinal contrast between Asian diversity patterns and African and American diversity patterns. So again, there are some subtleties to this single gradient. We talk about the latitudinal diversity gradient. It's not one gradient, it's a conjunction of many gradients and we ought to look more carefully at it. So 
in the simplest sense, biological diversity depends on, on three major factors. Speciation, which is genesis of new species. Extinction, which is the disappearance of species. And dispersal, which is rearrangements of the geography of species. And you can see we've, we've mentioned some things. You know, are the tropics a cradle of species? Is it where they are born uh, very um, abundantly? Is, um, is the latitudinal diversity gradient generated by extinction? Maybe higher extinction rates in non-tropical regions. And in that sense, the tropics have been referred to as a museum of biological diversity. And then you can also imagine non-random dispersal. Is there dominant dispersal into the tropics or out of the tropics? Now let's go into this a bit further. Um, I picked out just, just one, but there are many dozens of papers reviewing the ecological and evolutionary drivers of, of geographic variation in species diversity or hypotheses for the latitudinal diversity gradient. And I just want to point to you that they, these studies have come to uh, generate a large number of ideas. Um, in this particular one, um, these findings are consistent with the hypothesis that the large extent of tropical environment and area effect, together with greater climatic stability, has promoted speciation and reduced extinction rates. Energy availability contributes indirectly. Um, biotic interactions likely augment diversification and coexistence. So notice we've got a ton of different major classes of explanations that are being that are being marshaled to explain this 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 set of phenomena and so what we set out to do is to ask what is the role of spatially structured heterogeneous climate change in generating biodiversity and so we're asking a very simple version of that bigger question we're isolating down to just a few of the explanations. And in fact, um, we're going we're gonna to simulate something that's quite simple. Imagine a real world, which is say the earth as you know it, with real world climate change, which is to say, imagine back through the Pleistocene or from the Pleistocene through to the present. Imagine simulating species that have ranges that get fragmented and isolated and then speciate when they've been isolated for a sufficient amount of time and species can go extinct as well. And so what we've built into this simple null model is real world climate variation and real world geography species that have a fixed fundamental ecological niche and those same species having uh, fixed dispersal abilities. Now what we've left out is effects of energy availability, effects of niche evolution and innovation, effects of biotic interactions. And so in some sense we've created uh, a null model or a very simple process minimal model of what species are and how they respond to our earth and, and how that translates into uh, biological diversity. So let's, let's explore this model and see what it tells us about the latitudinal diversity gradient. And so we're, we're asking a very simple question. If we create those simple, almost process null species in the context of a dynamic climate, what gradients do we get across the earth? So I'm just gonna give you some, some views of this. 
Um, this is a, a cellular automaton algorithm, which is to say we are tracking not individuals, but rather we're compartmentalizing the earth and tracking the dynamics of species distributions. And those dynamics are a consequence of dispersal, which is to say, does our species have access to a place? And they're a function of niche, which is to say, if a species has access to a place, is that place suitable for the species? And so they also bring in climate change. And what I want you to see here is a simulation of, of global climates roughly partitioned into the biomes that we have across the earth. Um, and you're seeing it over our simulation period which goes from a global warm period to a global cool period. And if you look, you can see those points uh, migrating down into the left, which would be a cool period, and up into the right, which would be a warm period. And we're gonna start our species with seeds from across the terrestrial realms of the earth which is to say we're gonna start our species with niches that are centered on the conditions present at the site that we are seeding. And we're gonna create species with two different kinds of niches and two different sets of dispersal abilities. The two kinds of niches are, are broad and narrow And the two sets of dispersal abilities are poor dispersal. You can see most of our species dispersing just one pixel from their current distribution versus good dispersal abilities where many more of our species can go two, three, maybe even four pixels away from their current distributions. And so that creates four different kinds of species. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail with the results on this. I just want you to know that we, we played around with uh, varying the parameters that went into our model. And you can see the, you can see the paper itself for, for the details. And we track um, how our species respond. So here on this x-axis of this graphic is time and you can see precipitation and temperature varying. You can see that they co-vary, which is to say they tend to change or stay stable kind of at the same time between the two dimensions of climate. Um, but there are times when precipitation goes down further or comes up higher than temperature does. And we track for our species, well, we track their phylogeny and all of that information gets saved. And the phylogeny through all of this, this is through time, these are at different points in this, in this temporal simulation, we might see range expansion like here. We might see our species develop a disjunction like here. And if that disjunction persists long enough, we start to call them uh, separate species. And so that would be one of these bifurcations in the phylogeny. And we also track extinction, which is to say, we might have a species that starts here, it expands out, oh, but it starts to contract, continues to contract until no pixel holds suitable uh, conditions for that species. This is just an example, and you can see a species that started fairly interior, but you can see it uh, moving around in response to changing climate patterns. Okay, so we ran literally a ton of these simulations, and we did a ton of analyses, particularly 
uh, Hui Jie Chiao and, and Aaron Saup. Um, and we came out with results that were quite interesting, which is to say, when we look across many, 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 many simulations and we analyze our data lots of different ways, but in general mimicking how data are analyzed in studies of latitudinal diversity gradients, we get this gradient of biological diversity. And what you can see is in the far south, in the southern hemisphere, low diversity. Near the equator, we see this very large uh, peak of diversity. And then in the northern hemisphere, at times we see this secondary peak and at times we don't. I'm not going to go into all the details, but I want you to see how this latitudinal diversity gradient compares to real latitudinal diversity gradients. And so here are real gradients for birds, mammals, and amphibians. And what I want you to notice is that the major features coincide very closely. The peak around the equator, the generally very low southern hemisphere um, diversity, but also this, this lower peak in the northern hemisphere. So we're kind of very happy with our models that our models were able to generate a very realistic latitudinal diversity gradient. We can ask some questions about speciation and extinction. We can see uh, this is with different, um, different assumptions about ice sheets, but essentially what we can see is um, that speciation is quite high in the tropics, although also in the northern hemisphere temperate zone. We can see that Extinction is kind of oddly variably uh, depressed or not in the tropics. And low in the southern hemisphere, but relatively high in the northern hemisphere. Which is to say, just as I indicated to you when we were looking at the different continents, there's a lot of stuff going on here. We've got a lot of work left to do. Dispersal is very interesting. Dispersal from the temperate zone into the tropical zone, this far, is actually much less than dispersal from the tropical zone into the temperate zone. And so that would not be something that would generate dis diversity in the tropics. And so what have, we, what have we learned? Again, I'm not going into hyper detail because I don't want this talk to be terribly long, um, but what have we learned about mechanisms? What we've learned is that certainly all those hypotheses that talk about uh, biotic interactions being more strict or, or energy input being greater or um, things like that, we don't necessarily see any support for them because simulations that don't include those factors actually are able to generate very realistic um, latitudinal diversity gradients. Now, we're not the only um, virtual world simulation out there. Um, I know of a couple that have, have begun to produce interesting research results. Um, I'm gonna point you towards one in particular um, this one from Thiago Rangel, um, Rob Colwell, Carson Rabeck, uh, Alexandre Diniz Filio, and a bunch of other colleagues, um, some of whom you've heard from in, the, in this course. Um, and they've done some very, very interesting work. Um, here's a, here's a, a pair of maps showing observed and simulated bird species richness. Uh, this simulation was quite different from ours in that it included those other processes like niche evolution and uh, biotic interactions. 
And so the design and the thinking framework is different. But they did some very fascinating things like uh, they assessed the role of the Andean mountain chain, which runs like this. They assessed the role of the Andes in generating South American uh, biological richness. And they did it by simply erasing the Andes experimentally. These are things that you can do with a simulation, but obviously you can't do them in the real world. And they showed a really crucial role in the, of the Andes in generating the diversity that we see across South America. Could that be pointing us towards other such um, implications like, like why is Africa less diverse in general than South America, particularly for forest organisms? Maybe, a lot of work left to do. Uh, our simulation has seen other applications as well. Um, an earlier study of the impacts of niche breadth and dispersal ability. Remember we created those, those four types of species, but what are the impacts on macroevolutionary patterns like diversity, speciation rates, extinction rates, things like that? Uh, we looked at non-random uh, gradients in range size and niche breadth. You probably have, have heard about Rappaport's rule. Well, very interestingly, what we see is that Rappaport's rule and latitudinal diversity gradients, things like that, that have been the subject of lots and lots of, of hypotheses of complex mechanisms of generating uh, diversity or generating bio biological patterns, um, we find that even our very simple null species that have very few processes associated with them, even those species can uh, replicate these patterns very closely. So where are we going with this sort of work? We've got a bunch of questions to ask. You know, what is the role of niche evolution in biological diversification? What is the role of topographic change, like uplift of major mountain chains in, in biological diversification? You could even go so far as to what is the role of basic characteristics of the earth, like the obliquity of, of its axis of rotation in creating Bio, biological diversity. What would the earth look like if its axis were completely vertical or completely horizontal? It would be fascinating. So more, more, more fundamentally, virtual worlds allow us to ask and address and, and answer some fundamental questions in biology, ecology, biogeography, that otherwise have been assessed only by correlation, by looking for patterns out there in the real world. I find it very, very exciting to be able to think about manipulating certain factors to test and address questions that otherwise we can't address in a very powerful scientific framework. So I hope that um, this has been interesting to you. It's not really a talk about ecological niche modeling. Rather, it's more a talk about what can we do with all these thinking frameworks? Uh, what sorts of questions can we ask? Um, I encourage you to look at some of the, the, the big, highly cited studies in, in macroecology and in global biogeography, and ask, what could we learn? How could, how could these methods and these ideas related to distributional ecology, how could they help us to ask some of these questions in different ways? That's kind of what we're doing with these virtual world simulations. I hope this has been interesting to you. And I'll look forward to seeing the questions that this generates in the question and answer session. Take care, everybody. Stay safe out there and, and have a good day.